what I want to say tonight is um, we're about to share information about uh, three things. Um, it's the structure, governance, and um, the balance of structure of the government and our indigenous structure, the band office, the, the reserve. Um, and the, end, the next thing I want to share after that is a myth. And then we're going to go into 21 things you should know about the Indian Act. Um, the Indian Act is really key because that's the first document that uh, was produced between the government and the Aboriginal people or First Nations people. Um, <clears throat> so that's what we're going to do first of all. And as Chris said that um, what we're about to share to you tonight is that it's not a, a message of doom and gloom or blame. It's strictly information that I feel that all Canadians should know. And vice versa, your culture, my culture, it's a thing that to share with each one. And um, when I uh, began this journey in your church here, I felt kind of awkward because when you're teaching Aboriginal history, uh, people tend to wiggle in their chair, especially when you're coming to some parts of the history that are very sensitive. And often people would tell me, uh, Norman, I wasn't part of this. Uh, I wasn't even born. My dad wasn't even born, and on and on. So why are you bringing all this information up? Well, this information is very important, not only to me presenting it, but to you that's listening in. And I really want to be clear on that. I'm not standing here tonight or sharing tonight to blame anyone or blame any country. It's information about our Aboriginal people. I look back day after day and read all the time and I study that it's um, uh, very, very, very important to me and to you that we can share. Like, like Chris said, we're walking down this road together and it's not a blame game. It's information that we all need to know. But anyway, I just want to share that. And the first thing tonight I want to share is um, the structure um, with, um, first of all, some of you that, this is how we greet one another at least with the Woodland Cree, we say Tanse, that T A N S T I means how are you? And that's what they want to ask you tonight. How are you? I hope you're well. So that's Tanse, hello. Five letters. So the first thing is that the government of Canada. You can read my writing. I hope you can. If you can read my writing, it's a miracle. Oh, just kidding. You. I think we'll have to. Can you write it a little bit bigger? Can, is it? You probably can't see that. No. Okay. You, you can see it. I'm seeing yes and no. Wow. Um, can we maybe bring it closer here? Okay. Is that okay? Yeah. You have to write bigger, Chris. Yeah. And bigger. Yeah. So better and then bigger. Yeah. This is like a game of Pictionary. Okay, I got three words. Okay, anyway. Um, okay. I'll go grab something for you. But just write big, Norm. I think we're good. I'll go grab you something. Okay. 
think we've had too much office furniture here. <laughs> um, I can give it a try again. Normally I have good handwriting, okay? And we I, can I'll see that you, now, I'll Norm. I'll tell you why I got good handwriting. Not that I'm bragging. When I was in school in, in up in northern Saskatchewan, if we spoke our language, they would call us into the classroom and they'd give us a strap. And first of all, and then they would make you write on the blackboard, usually, usually a couple hundred times, I will not speak Cree. So I got a flow to my writing. So that's just some what to learn. So, so the first one we have is the government of Canada. The government of Canada is the sole controller, basically, of how they relate to the, the native organizations. And the three organizations that that are that are recognized by the native people are the First Nations. Those are the people that have a treaty card, a card that's registered in Ottawa, giving you certain privileges, okay? And then you have the uh, Metis. Metis are mixed, but they soon will be recognized as as First Nations people really, because that is the thing that was passed in Ottawa and the Supreme Court of Canada, they have recognized the Métis as First Nations or Aboriginal people with status. And the third group that Canada deals with and recognize are the Inuit people. They're the people that live way up north in Nunavut. I lived there for four years, by the way. Very, very cold. So the government of Canada, oh, the government of Canada is the, the sole thing. And then down below, you have, you have the ministers. And below the ministers, you have deputy ministers that are responsible to go and negotiate and work with the First Nations. In Canada, to the best of my knowledge today, there are 643 reserves across Canada. In Saskatchewan, there's 74. I think there's 200 in BC. Don't quote me or uh, that's what I have to, uh, today. So all these ministers, that are appointed by the prime minister work with the First Nations and the Métis and the Inuit. So, and then we go down below and they have different deputies and associate ministers and people like that. So eventually they get down to the reserve. There's a reserve just down the street here. If you go and gas up at the Petrocan over here, that's a reserve. Um, so when, when the um, minister gets close or the relationship with the, the band and the chiefs, and they start to find out all the needs and the issues on the reserve from the chiefs and the councillors. At that time, usually the government will move the minister out of this position to another place. And even below the deputies, the, the ministers, when they get close to working with the native people, they shuffle them. And they're so that there's never a balance. Everything is always like this. So just when they get to know 
the issues and things are happening, they move people. And it's the same with the, at the reserve level. When the chiefs just get to know the Minister of Indigenous Affairs and the deputies, there's always election, or most of the time there's election every three or four years. So just when the chiefs and the councillors get close to the government, there is an election. So the priorities change, the people change, the agendas change. So there's never really a balance. And that's why things are, I would say, difficult, uh, frustration. So that's what happens here. The chief changes, the councillors change. The chief and council are just like uh, the mayor. You have the mayor, but you have a chief, then you have the councillors. So, but at the end of the day, I hope you can read my writing upside down. <laughs> oh, sorry about that, folks. But at the end of the day, on the reserve, all the issues are still the same. I was talking to a friend today that there's, for I think it's now 14 or 13 years, one reserve in Northern Ontario has been promised clean water. And that's not happened yet. Now, can you imagine if you were uh, in Kamloops on North Shore had no drinking water or for 13 years, you would probably have a, a riot, at least a small one anyways. So, but these are some of the issues that the Indian Affairs, the government promises, uh, uh, and they're still on the table. Very little has changed. I'll give you an example. In Saskatchewan, up in northern Saskatchewan, in a community called Anosh, population 2,500, there were seven people shot to death. Teachers, teacher's aide, um, some students. So Trudeau made two runs into northern Saskatchewan, promising all kinds of stuff. And today, on my last trip up there less than a year ago, there's about six security guards that are hired and basically very little has changed. I'm not pointing things out negatively. I'm just giving you stories that are real, okay? So down here, the chiefs we have to be on the reserve have the same on. issues. What do you mean? There's housing, there's health, there's, there's, yeah. health, there's education, there's housing, there's water. There's all sorts of things that that are always there, or most of the time is there. Unmute. So to say to you, that balance is always on the table. So one of the myths I'm gonna to talk to you about later on is that I hear many people tell me, oh, the Indians get everything for nothing. Everything, everything, everything for nothing. And I'm gonna share some of the myths with you, but I'm gonna tell you something that every dollar that you and I and many others pay are tax. By the time the government gets it here, it gets down all the way to the reserve. You know how much of that dollar gets down to the native people? 
I was told it's between 35 and 40 cents. So all the rest is eight nut and bureaucracy. All these people, deputies, assistant deputy, minister, all that is eight nut. So I just wanted to clarify that because quite often I hear that, oh, Norman, you guys are getting everything for nothing. But it's really important to know not only the amount of money that, that they get, but um, the structure, Ottawa, all the bureaucracy, then down to the reserve. And it's the same with the Métis. The Métis is another recognized group across Canada. They are de dealt the same with the government. They're basically the same as First Nations. And then you got the Inuit who are in Nunavut in the Arctic. They're basically the same, same structure. But those three are the recognized groups um, that we deal with from day to day. So I wanted to deal with that. First of all, if you have any questions, don't be afraid to ask. Um, yes. So I just want to be clear on this, on this, that the government, the money, where it goes, how it flows, and who gets it at the end of the day. And on the reserve, because the reserves are, some are big, some are small, but there's a lot of pressure on the leadership to do as much as they can with the money they get. And then again, <clears throat> that's another political, a political thing on the reserve when you're dealing with them. When you are dealing with um, people, you're dealing with money, you're dealing with all sorts of issues. And then there's the political things, same as up, up here, government, there's politics. And the same on the reserve, there's politics. Usually, it's the bigger clan gets the most. And the smaller clan, you get the little. You're at the bottom. And then there's all sorts of things that take place in that chain. And it's the same thing, town council, you know, sometimes they say, well, the greasy, the greasy wheel <laughs> gets some action. Well, it's no different on the reserve. But I really have a compassion for the First Nations people. And we'll go that into that history next time, our next, our next session. And some of the things that I will share with you will be so touching. We wonder why these things ever happen. And I am grateful tonight to, to be able to, as an elder, to sit here tonight with you and share. I think that's about it what I have on that. So I just want to mark those three groups again is the Inuit, the Metis, and the First Nations. They are the three recognized groups in Canada and they're funded with dollars that we get from the taxpayers. So, um, the next subject I had I wanna share with you is that um, there are, I got seven First Nations facts that you should know. And like I, the first one that I, I mentioned to you tonight is 643 across Canada, coast to coast, north to south. 
to 640 Street. And um, each of them have um, a different structure or maybe the same, it depends which tribe and which um, area you're from. It could be the North, could be the South, but there are 643. And in Canada, there's well over a million First Nations people. In society today, in Kamloops or across Canada, we have our beliefs, okay? And the Aboriginal people or Indigenous people, sometimes I forget what to call myself because the government gives us different names. One day we're Indigenous, next time we're Aboriginal, next time we're Indian, but we know who we are in Christ. That's a good thing. So many of the native people have different creations beliefs. Each nation has its own beliefs, told some told in a story form. For example, the Iroquois creation, they often include elements of the earth being formed. Can you imagine on a turtle's back was animals and all creative creatures providing guidance and such. In BC, I noticed there's many, many uh, totem poles telling stories, sharing their culture. So each one of, the, of the, them have a different beliefs. They have their own culture. They, all, they have their own worldviews. They have their own cultural practices symbols, belief systems, and one is, and they're each influenced by usually the experience on the land with each other. And they're always connected, they say, in the spirit world. So that's important to know that you have beliefs, and they have beliefs, they have their own culture, and we have our own culture. And Saskatchewan, for example, in the south, they have a lot of beliefs that, um, for example, the sweat lodge, uh, what do you call it? Um, oh. There we go, blank. They have their own sweat lodge and their own beliefs in animals. For example, there's a tribe that really have beliefs in the bear. Some have it in the owl and the eagle. So it's very, to be very careful, I guess, that we, uh, we may not agree with what they're doing, but it's also good to, to know about that. For example, one of their cultural things are powwows and their dances. Some do the sun dance, some do the chicken dance. Um, so all those dances bring different meaning. Some are spiritual and some aren't. So at one time, an elder told me that, that a powwow was like a sports day where people came together they had fun, they had, did this, and they did that. But as the power grew, well, you know what enters is money. Now they're huge, there's thousands of dollars put into powwows. And people come there and they put a lot of work into effort into their regalia. And, their, and it's, just, it's just a beautiful thing. So, I don't know if you've ever been to a powwow, but um, they're very, very nice, very pretty. A lot of work put into it. When you see little people, big people dancing. So I would encourage you to check them out first, but you may go to one. So uh, 
was always thinking today, I wish I didn't have all these papers so I wouldn't be able to read from them, but there's a lot of paper. <laughs> a lot to remember. <laughs> oh, Lord, thank you. Yeah. For an example, there's a circle, a sacred symbol. You'll notice sometimes we talk about the medicine wheel. That's a symbol that many of our people use. Another one they use is tobacco. Do you know that the elders say that even before another race came to this country, they used tobacco as a ceremony. Then the government come in use the tobacco to sell. That was never, never intended. That's what the elders tell me. I didn't get that out of the book. Got that from the elders. So that tobacco is key to them. Drums are round and as are the sweat lodges and the teepees. The circle is a symbol of the cycle of life. If you just think about it, at one time, you were like this. You grow up, you go through life, and you go this way. All of a sudden, you come back. Because they say, when you're older, you shrink. I don't know if it's just me, but I think I've shrunk, okay? <laughs> I don't know how much, but... So, today, I am where my mother is. My daughter is where I was. And my grandchildren are where their mother was. So you see that chain, that circle of life. That is very, very sacred to the many native people I met and worked with. That circle, that medicine wheel, is very, very important. I often tell people about our elders. Our elders in our community and our reserve are not sacred, but they're held high in self-esteem. They're held high, high. And I think sometimes that we have lost that. At one time, we looked after our elders, for example. We didn't put them in old folks' home. We kept, kept them till they left us. I'm not saying that that is the end all, be all, but that's something we did. So just think of those, the symbols, the culture, the beliefs. Um, and taking the gospel at times, it's really difficult when you come across that. I had a, a friend that I went to school with. Um, in fact, he had the same name as me. And um, I hadn't seen him for a while. So I met him one time at a cafe and I said, Norman. And he said, don't you call me Norman anymore. I said, I said, you were Norman when I went to school with you. He said, my name is Black Bear now. So that how they get their names is is a very special way for them. And when we go to residential school, the next session, we will see how the government and the churches have changed our names, our original names. They changed them. And, but we'll get into that at another time. Um, so for the native people, there has been a constant change. And for many of us, change is hard 
Number one, to accept and to adapt, eh? So, but we're trying our best today to do that. Do you have any questions? If you do, you can ask Chris. Yeah, you can put <laughs> You're gonna set me up? Yeah. yeah, if you guys have questions, uh, put it in the chat. There is some good dialogue on there. Uh, There's a question about what's the proper name for Indigenous people. So uh, Bonnie uh, chimed in on that, uh, who is Indigenous herself. So you can continue to do that. Uh, look in the chat. If you have questions, uh, throw them in. Some have just been, have directed them to me. If you could just put it to the whole group so then everybody can kind of follow along, that would be fantastic. So Norm, do you want to talk about the myths now or do you want to take? Oh, we'll talk about the myths. Okay. Start the noise. Okay. Um, I just want to be clear with you folks that, that the structure of the government and the reserves and the Métis settlements and the Inuit people. Just a note uh, with the, um, the Inuit people up in the Arctic where they live, or most of them live, there is no reserves for the Inuit people. I lived amongst them for four years when I was working up there. So they don't have reserves, but the funding source is the same. The dollars come from Ottawa, they trickle down, and that's how they function. So the, the Inuit people, and we'll go on sometime down the road, we'll talk about land claims and a bit about treaties, and that the Inuit people don't have treaties, they have a land claim. And if you look at the map of Canada, you'll see this big chunk of land that was given to the Inuit people. Inuit I, here means many. In, Inuk, I, Inuk means one person. Inuit means many. So, and in their language, we as Christians, we say God, we say Jesus. In, in the Inuit language, that just, this is a little extra, okay? Those are free. Yeah. <laughs> the Inuit call God Guti. G-O-T-T-I, Guti. Many of our native people use the term creator. To me, the creator is God Almighty, the beginning and the end. So that's a, that's a little bit to learn about the structure. They don't have reserves in Nunavut. They got a land claim, but they got the same structure for dollars. It trickles down various departments, different people. And again, in the, in the in Nunavut, there's never a balance because again, they have elections. People change, mayors change, chiefs change, councillors change, but many of the same issues are there. As I said earlier, housing, unemployment, uh, abuse, elders, health, education, water, land, all of those, and we'll get deeper into that next time. But I just wanted to share with you the structure. It's like in Kamloops, we got an MLA, we got a member of parliament, we got the mayor, we got councillors, and trickle down. I don't know how much money they get in Kamloops, but anyways, that's that's the way it goes with that. So. I hope it's making sense to you what I'm sharing, okay? Um, if you have any questions, I'll just save them. All right, there, there's a question. Okay. Can, can I interrupt you? Uh, this is a question from Teague. 
Uh, Teague, is, is there no communication between ministers when one leaves and one takes over? Because you were saying, uh, you know, that there's so much change and turnover. Is there no communication? So that's the first part. The second part is, do the Indigenous people have any nonpartisan rep representation? So I think what he's asking is, actually, hey, T, can you just ask the question? You just unmute yourself. Just, the question is, um, because of the changeover in parties, is there any procedure when one leaves and the other one uh, comes on? And um, do they have to follow the mandates of the parties or the affiliates? Do you know what he's asking? So with all the change that's going on, if, if like, like a, let's say Trudeau leaves and then another administration comes in, yeah. is there no communication there? Do they have to restart? Like, why doesn't it continue? To the best of my knowledge, attending different chiefs meetings in Ottawa and regional meetings is when there's a change, agendas change, priorities change, but there are some issues, some communications that still exist because they have um, the Assembly of First Nations is the group in Ottawa that represents, I think, mainly every reserve in Canada. And then you got the Métis Nation Council of Canada that represents all the Métis people across Canada. So to answer your question, there is some dialogue that still lingers, but basically everything changes because ministers, deputy ministers, superintendents, all have their, basically their own agenda. Right. So, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. No. So they have their own agendas, and then basically you're starting from scratch. So it takes again a year or two before you get to know your government. And then all of a sudden, in a year or two, there's an election. Right. So it's almost like a vicious cycle. And I've had many people tell me, Norman, why aren't you happy? Why aren't you satisfied with what the government is doing for you? Well, I could go on and on. We have to look at the treaties. We got to look at the land claims. All those are key to what's happening today. But to answer your question, there's a very little uh, relationship or communication when government change. It takes quite a while. They'll appoint a Minister of Indigenous Affairs and then the message goes down. It trickles down to the reserve, to the tribal councils, and then they start meeting, meeting and bring it forth the same issues basically. And the Minister of Indigenous Affairs only does what his government leader tells him to do. So it's, a, it's quite a system, but that's all you have right now. So that's why many reserves or First Nations are asking for self-government. That what self-government is, is we want to manage our own affairs. We know what we need, we know what's best for us, and we know the most economical way to do business. And very few reserves across Canada have that self-government. And after I said earlier, we're talking about governance. Governance means you have to be accountable. And that's always an issue because you're looking after 640 some First Nations, but everybody's got to send in their year in and sometimes that doesn't happen. And yeah. there's a lot of different things, they but that's governance means, governance means you should be accountable. And, but that's been worked on. Hey Norm, just a follow-up question, can I interrupt yeah. you? 
Question, a good question. Uh, this is what I was going to ask. So we have the government changing all the time, which creates you know instability and different agendas. And, but then you also have the the indigenous government structure, and they change as well. So the question is, how often does the tribal council change? Like on the reserve, how yeah. often do they get all those things? To the best of my knowledge, some change three years, yearly. Some four. So within this change, the chief might be doing a super job with his council members. And if a new chief comes in, he or she has an agenda. So there's kind of a stall and then they move on with their agenda. So that's the way it is, it's three years or four years. Okay, good, another question. Uh, Jerry is asking, would self-government uh, help solve the problem of the lack of drinking water? That is what the government is telling uh, the, the, the chiefs and the reserves are saying, let us do it. Give us the money, let us do it. And recently I've been talking to some of them. They brought in these consultants they charge enormous dollars. They, they drill for water. And next thing you know, they, they hire a company to build a, a water treatment plant. It's built cheaply and it breaks down and we're back to square one. So what self-government is saying is, give us the money, let us do it. And I'll give you some name of the reserves. There's uh, White Cap, just north, south of Saskatoon. They're in, in the state of self-government and they are probably one of the most prosperous reserves. And same with uh, West Bank First Nations. They are enormously well-functioned, well-managed. Same with this reserve over here. It appears that by in Kamloops, just what direction is that? Anyways, over here. That way. <laughs> that way. I don't know. They are well managed. So uh, that's what the native people want is we want to manage our own affairs. Can and, be. Uh, yeah. Uh, lots of chat here, Norm. Do you want to take a break from some questions and move on to some myth busting? We can answer questions. You want to do okay. Uh, Len's asking how cohesive are tribal councils and the band's reserves? Like, is there infighting even within local lo lower levels of indigenous government? Not all, but sometimes it's like a horse race. Whoever gets ahead gets the most. Like I said earlier, if you got a band of a thousand members. And you're the chief and you're related to the majority of them usually those people get first dibs at most everything it's rather sad but i've seen it time and time again so every time there's an election whoever gets elected has their priorities and there's I'll be honest with you, there's even in, in the society we're in now, there's a lot of nepotism. Right. And that takes place. So uh, there's an example of another place, a Metal Lake Tribal Council in northern Saskatchewan. They got the biggest logging business going in Saskatchewan, I think in Alberta. They're humongous. They um, they are part owner of a pulp mill. They own a sawmill supplying lumber all over the states. They are, are business minded. So they don't really need a lot of money from the government. There's another reserve just out of Calgary, west of Calgary called Morley. There's two other reserves under the umbrella. When I did some work there with them, their budget for more than gas at that time I think it was 92 or 93.5 million dollars. So they had a lot of money and they were doing a lot of different things. They were managing their money and they had to get audited. 
same as anybody else, but they had the freedom to do. And on those reserves, there's not a problem with drinking water. There's not a problem or very little problem with housing. So they want the opportunity to do, do it themselves. All right. Uh, that's good. Good conversation. I hope that's helpful. I think, I think that kind of the point of it all, Norm, is there's just so much change and instability that it's hard and bureaucracy, it's hard for lasting change to come to Indigenous people. Would you agree with that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. I think the first treaty or what, I think it was 1807. Here we are in 2021. We look at history, what has changed? And we're not looking at being negative here, okay? But what has changed? And you can look on the other way, what can change if you give them the opportunity? We see a lot of positives, okay? We see many of our people in universities, judges, lawyers, nurses, doctors, tradespeople. So we're slowly climbing out of that, what I call a dungeon or a hole. We are climbing out. So you see the people doing it slowly, slowly. Yeah. You see lots of role models. And that's where we come in as believers to come behind them, to encourage them, and to tell them about Jesus Christ. Awesome. All right, take it away. What's that? Take it away. Okay. <laughs> it's a long time since I've talked for two hours. <laughs> You're doing great, Norm. That's a little while. But anyways, that's good. That's, that's what you're here for. That's right. Anybody know what the definition of a myth is? Again, I have to look in the dictionary. It says the definition of a myth, according to the Oxford Canadian Dictionary, <clears throat> is a wildly held but false notion. And there are many wildly held but false notions or myths regarding the perceived special privileges of indigenous people in Canada. Myths surrounding indigenous people cover many aspects which have been endured for generations and continue to do so, often paint a distorted picture that does not represent reality for many of our native people across the land. When I was in Prince Albert, I was involved in a study for the city on race relations. We sent out a, uh, a form to different parts of the city and we coded these forms. And in Prince Albert, there's um, what you call the wards, there's different wards, eh? So we sent them out and many of them came back and one of the questions we had in this forum was, would you consider living next door to an Aboriginal person? <laughs> Some of the questions, the answers were never, never, because they have too many old cars and they pile up. Though I don't want any of them next door to me because the price of my house will go down and it won't sell. Right. Another one was, we don't want them next door to us because they're always drinking and fighting. So those are just some of the mindset. And, um, the, um, the answer I had to one of the city leaders was, it's because I see that our people are open 
in drinking. They'll drink in the park or they'll drink, find a place. And that's what people see. They, they walk down the street. That's what I call horse blinders. And all those things horses wear, they can only see straight ahead. They can't see this way or that way. And that's what many, many people see. They don't see beyond that. And even as Christians, if that's what we wear nowadays, we better buy a horse. <laughs> that's just my own opinion, okay? <laughs> so, that's, um, it said there are three distinct organizations. I told you the First Nations, the Métis, and the Inuit people. It says here, the first one is indigenous people already have ample reserve lands and resources. Well, if you ever travel around, it depends on the treaties and the land claims on how big the reserves are. Some are smaller, some are large. Some hold 5,000 people, some hold 2,000. So some reserves are small, some are vast, from urban centers, education facilities, employment opportunities, but don't make the mistake of equating reserves with, the treat, with, with traditional treaty territories, which can be vast, like a treaty. I think there's 11 across Canada, if you look on the map. Well, actually, we're gonna show you one next time we get together here you'll see the land, the land base. And one thing to, to note, when you look at the land claims, they overlap and they're huge. Some are smaller, but most are huge. And the reason they overlap is the native people at one time, and even today are, are what's the word now? They're very migrants, I guess you could call it. They move. They move to different, different parts for various reasons, but they're very mobile. That was the culture a long time ago. They followed the keychain. It's like us following McDonald's today, okay? <laughs> Just kidding, okay. So they followed the food chain. So those treaties overlapped. So that. And reserves, the reserves today, even next door, you go next door, they are held by the government for the use and the benefit of all band members and are subject to the Indian Act and to the terms of any treaty or surrender. The governor and council may determine whether any purpose for which lands in, in a reserve are used or to be used for land use to the benefit of the reserves. I'm going to tell you folks, this is my opinion, okay, that I look at the reserve as not a concentration camp, but a power, uh, power base piece of land because they control everything basically that the reserve does. Who's they? Like the government? The government. Okay. They call her Her Majesty. So traditional lands are used to an area when the, na the nation is occupied and used many for many generations. Like this land was from the beginning to now, but the government, and I'm gonna walk you through some of the things that when the first treaty was signed and the people, the native people were put on a chunk of land, that was to control. And today they still control. I said a long time ago, Excuse me. 
I say that is that um, at one time the native people across this land before the Europeans came, the other people came, the native people, and my grandpa and his grandpa told him and my dad that they had the freedom to go wherever they went. And when the treaty was signed, the very first treaty, the government said, in writing that as long as the as long as the sun shines, the river flows, and the grass grows, we will look after you. Don't worry, we look after you. At one time, our people looked up to God in heaven, to Him. And when the government signed that treaty, our people no longer looked up to the Creator, or they did, but not as much, and they looked to creation. And as far as I'm concerned, as a person, it's personal that when the government did that, they killed the Indian. We no longer look up to the one we're going to stand before one day. To the one that says in his book, the Bible, he'll supply all your needs. And Queen we say, ask them, come to me. Jesus says, come to me. This is not a sermon, it's just information, okay? Preach it, brother. Yeah. Come on. So, so the reserves are a very controlling piece of land for me. Some First Nations were located to reserves in area that were completely alienated. And as the people moved into the country, the government put layers on land that the government at that time said the, the, the land is no use. It's land that you can never do anything on. So that's myth number one. That's myth number one. Okay. Yeah, okay. yeah. And number two is what's I think here's number three is the indigenous peoples can do whatever they want with their reserved lands and resources. That is not true. For this myth to be true, all indigenous people in Canada would live on reserves. In reality, a reserve is a track of land set aside under the Indian Act and treaty agreements for the exclusive use of an Indian band, First Nations, Métis, and Inuit have no reserves. So the Métis and the Inuit. The ultimate title to reserve land is invested for the crown. Majesty. So what I'm telling you tonight is, if you live on a reserve, you will never own, excuse me, most of the homes you will never own when you leave or transfer to another family. The land you'll never own. The crown owns it. The resources, the resources that are under the ground are not belonging to the native people. So those are some what some of the myths that you'll, you'll see. Is a transaction of any kind whereby a band or a band member there purports to sell, to barter, exchange, or give, otherwise dispose, say for example, cattle, animals, grain, hay, whether wild or cultivated plants from a reserve in Manitoba and Saskatchewan in Alberta to a person other than a member of that band is void. In other words, if you want to go beyond that, you have to go to 
you have to go to superintendent or engine affairs and ask permission. When we get into the residential school, just one little note. And my mom and my dad were in residential school. As if their parents wanted to come and see them, they had to give the ask the Indian agent for permission. If they just went on their own, they would be thrown in jail for six months. And since the government passed legislation in the 19 and early 20th centuries, allowing the government to cut, cut portions of the reserve land into private for public utilities right away. For example, if they wanted to make road or put power lines through, they, uh, they, would, they would do that. But this was done without consulting the reserve, the band offices, or the chief and council. I think that was rude. In many cases, the province or crown further retained subsoil sub rights on the reserve, which means band members do not own the minerals found there. So, and that maybe the reserve here, if they found oil, that would be interesting. Same with the, um, the coastal waters and along the ocean here that in many cases they don't own a lot of the waterways and fishing grounds. We notice in the East Coast, the natives, the Micmacs were fighting for, for their fishing rights and it came pretty nasty. So it's, um, it's rather um, sad, but the more you know what happens from the top to the ground level, it'll open your mind or open the window of your thinking as we deal and meet Aboriginal people. So, Another myth is indigenous people living on reserves get free housing. In some cases, depending on the reserve, they get free housing, but don't they pay for the utilities. They get free housing, but they never own the home. It's different in Kamloops. You buy a home, you pay for it, you own it. On the reserve, it's the majority don't ever own the home. I've seen some cases where people living on the reserve got a piece of land from the band office, chief and council, and they built their own house. So those people own their own home. They pay the mortgage, they pay the bank to own that home. So, but it's very few. So, but the government of Canada has different, so Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation offers many programs to assist native people for housing. For example, if you were living in a major <coughs> settlement and in Alberta, there are seven major settlements that are designated land by the government of Alberta. It's like a reserve, but on a major settlement, they have a taxing system. It's like, uh, or say like merit, they have a tax system. They pay tax, pay for the water, pay for, for a power bill. <coughs> so the Métis, that's what they have in Alberta. They do have <clears throat> that, that help. There are some housing programs to help Native people designed to give low-income families access to rental housing. And if you go into some of the bigger cities, Saskatoon, Edmonton, Calgary, probably Kamloops too, Kelowna, there are housing programs for Aboriginal people, Indigenous people that move to the city. 
that that's one of the key factors for moving off the reserve into a city. You've got all these things in front of you. For example, on the reserve, you don't have damage deposits. You don't have most of the time power bills. You got um, a cable, you got telephone. So in the cities, there's housing for native people. I don't know how big, but there is some. Uh, there's also housing for seniors and for low income people. So that's a real bonus. On many reserves, except some that are developed self-government agreements, the house is owned, but the land is not. I just said that there. Therefore, it cannot be sold, which makes it impossible to build up equity in your home as it as is possible for non-Indigenous people. It, it, uh, additionally, the reality for most people is they need to take out a loan in order to buy a house and loans require collateral. If you were to sell a house on the reserve, it is probably set for a long time. The chances are that someone on the reserve might want to buy it and rent it out to make some money. And that's very rare. It's like um, if you were to buy a car, well, I'm going to get into that a little later. <clears throat> so it says the Indian Act limitations to seizing property on reserves make it extremely difficult to secure finance for anything. Whether you intend to buy, build, or renovate a house, start a business, or what have you, to be extremely clear, this is not an endorsement of attempt to unilaterally impose private property regimes on reserves. I'm just explaining things. Reserves are of finite size, and on some urban reserves, there is no room for expansion. Many of the cities in Canada have reserves within the city. There's one here, just this way here. Um, the KRB? Yeah. In that, yeah. yeah, that's a reserve within a city. And they function quite well. So they're becoming more popular. Uh, that, um, I'll just go back a bit. And I hope I'm not confusing you. Is that when the treaties were settled, the land claims, there's a, a money that's put out. It's called land entitlement fund. And that money is given to the reserves to buy land wherever they want. And they can develop that land into a business. For example, could be a drugstore, could be a car dealership. They can do that. And you see many of them having service stations, restaurants. You take the one over here, they got a, a petrol can, I think, and they got other businesses. They're leasing land to other businesses to generate income. So this reserve here, I would have to say, is pretty prosperous. Okay, so, so that's what governance does to you, self-government. It makes them become more self-sufficient. Um, another thing is that indigenous people are the fastest growing segment in Canada's population, with more than half of the population under the age of 25. This means additional challenge of available building space will become an issue on some reserves if you outgrow. But the what's taking place is the reserve might have 2,500 people on their band list, this membership list, but 
most of the people, or quite a few of them, are not on the reserve. They have moved out into the city, the urban areas uh, of the country. They have moved out to either go to school, get a job, all various things that they do. So on occasion, they'll come back and they'll they'll either visit or maybe some will return to work on the reserve. So for somebody to tell you they get free housing, that's not true. So aren't you glad to be a native today? <laughs> I'm just kidding, of course. I have a little humor. Hey, Len. Another one. Oh, I'm going to tell you something that just crossed my mind. Um, every year, during treaty days, treaty days are a, a celebration. Every year, most of the reserves that I know of have treaty days, a celebration. And many, many years ago, the government made a promise that every Indian First Nation will get a total of get a total of five dollars a year. A big deal. You should see it going on the reserve on treaty day. They get the RCMP in their red uniforms. They their dances. There's jigging. There's powwows. There's dances, and everybody's celebrating. But every year, every one that has a, is a member gets five dollars. Don't spend it all at one time. <laughs> Another myth I want to share with you is that all the Indian people, <clears throat> they don't pay taxes in Canada. That is the indigenous, the First Nations people. That's not including the Métis and the Inuit people. We have paid taxes from day one. I'm speaking for myself, for sure. So the agreement with the government is that the First Nations would not be taxed. But there are some restrictions that are coming around where <clears throat> in the store they'll pay and they get reimbursed. So, but who's going to argue for $5? So, but that's what I hear quite often. Hey, Norman, how come? How come you don't pay tax? Excuse me. I pay tax just like you, like my pastor here, and many other people. But if you're looking at other people, like from Peru or Mexico, when they come to Canada, they've got to pay taxes. That's only Canada's First Nations people that are excluded. They, this existed, this tax, since 1876. That's a long time. Status Indians do not pay federal or provincial taxes on their personal and real property that is on the reserve. For example, if I were to buy a car I would ask the dealer, the Toyota dealer, to bring it to the reserve, and I don't pay tax. But all the pre-arrangements have to be done with the bank to make sure there's full payment. So when I, if I bought a $20,000 car <clears throat> from a Toyota dealer here, I go to reserve, I don't know how much tax, GST, and all that stuff would be, but I imagine it would be quite a, lot, quite a bit. So that's the agreement that was made back then. 
1876. Another thing to understand is that when the native people working on a reserve are treating people, they do not take pay income tax. So if they get paid $5,000 a month, the only thing that I think they pay is unemployment insurance. Yes. That's what they pay and the rest they take home. So because um, my application for status is in process, I worked on a reserve and I, I didn't pay any tax. They refused to take off income tax. Can I ask a question? Yeah. So you're saying if you have status, you, there are some tax, there are some tax benefits or you don't pay as much tax if you do have status, right? Is that That's right, saying? yeah. And, and what you're saying is not all native, not all indigenous people have status. That's right, the Métis, right. the Inuit. Don't have status, but the first, the first, some First Nations do or all First Nations do? All First Nations do. Okay. Yeah. And, and is it different when you live on reserve than off reserve with some of the tax benefits that you get? That's right. Okay. Yeah. So when you're on reserve, yeah. you will, you can, you do get tax benefits if the work is done on the reserve yeah. or that exchange is done on the reserve. If, I were, if this church was on the reserve yes. and uh, if we're status, yeah. we come to work at the church. Yeah. You can't take any income tax. But the geography matters of where that is happening. That's right. If your status on reserve, then there are taxable benefits. Yeah. Right. Okay. If your work, say, for example, if I worked off the reserve yeah. in Kamloops, I'll pay income tax. Right. Same as you. So somebody from the Kamloops Indian Band, they work at uh, McDonald's downtown, they pay tax. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So that's one of the things that's when you're going to hear this word, native people don't pay taxes. And that's not true. I got a question here, Norm. Just Lens chiming in. Do reserves pay land tax? What's that? Do reserves pay land tax? No. Okay. Not that I'm aware. Of. Okay. I've never heard of it. Yeah, and Bethany just chimed in too uh, on the chat about some of the tax stuff that she had to pay living on reserves. So really helpful, Norm. This is good. Yeah. It's good. Also, there's a section 87 that says that exempts from federal goods and services, that's GST. The goods that are brought by status Indians that are business located on the reserves don't pay tax. Okay. And stuff that's delivered to the reserve are also exempt. Most provincial sales tax are simply applied. In some province, they are certain exemptions such as automobiles, which must be registered to an address on the reserve. So just, um, just uh, you know, make sure that when you hear that, that I'm sharing you information that, to the best of my knowledge, is accurate. It says the court has indicated that tax exemption is not intended to remedy economically disadvantaged position of Aboriginal people in Canada or to bring economic benefits to them also based on Supreme Court decision, Indian property not situated on the reserve will generally be subject to tax like everybody else, like every other Canadian, okay? Status Indians do not pay income tax earned on the reserve is exempt, I just said that. <clears throat> so if you live off the reserve, you're gonna pay. So, gotcha. Yeah. Um, here are some points to further clarify the reality of a myth that Indigenous people don't pay taxes in Canada. Personal property exempt facts. A tax exemption for Indian property situated on the reserve has existed before Federation. The Supreme Court of Canada stated that the exemption is linked to the protection of reserve land and property. The court concluded that the purpose of exemption is to make sure tax does not erode the use of Indian property on reserve. So just to clarify that so you know. So 
somebody put in writing a story, Justin, there's no free gas. So I... <laughs> also, when you go to when you go to the reserve as a status, if you if you have your status card, they go and gas up. You usually pay anywhere from eight to ten cents cheaper on gas. That's if it's on reserve land. That service station is on reserve land. Right. Can I just interrupt you for a second? I guess this is a good point. This is a big learning for me. So, Norm, you have not had status your whole life, correct? That's right, yeah. Uh, can you tell us the story about why you don't, why you have not had status your, your whole life? My dad is a Woodland Cree. He was born and raised on the reserve. My mother is a Denny, which is a, used to call it a Chippewan. Uh, uh, she was on the reserve, lived on the reserve. But my dad, at some time, could have been, when I was a baby or even before, the Indian Affairs agent came and bought the scripts. That's a piece of paper identifying you as a treaty Indian. He bought that for $5 from my dad, and my dad lost, lost, or we can use it like in the Bible, Joseph sold his rights. Right. So my dad was illiterate, couldn't read or write, said, okay, he put his X there, and now in Ottawa, they say you're not treaty. All because of a piece of paper. Mm -hmm. So now we've been fighting to get our treaty cards, our treaty status. Because it's a benefit to our children to get education, get housing, get all sorts of health and stuff. So, but that's the reason why. My dad signed this piece of paper. He signed that script and that eliminated him from, from status. From status. Yeah, so you know the question is how does an individual get status? So you have been trying to get status for a long time and still don't have it. That's right. Because eons ago the government said, if you give up your rights, we will give you this. And so then you, yeah. your dad, and your family has not had status. Yeah. Okay. See, that's all like that's all helpful to know. Uh, about how that all works. Yeah, and um, there are many of us who are <clears throat> designated as Métis, and recently, I think it's 2015, the Supreme Court of Canada said, you will be no more Métis. You are the same as the status Indians. So they're coming up with a whole bunch of designation uh, so that there's, we're not fighting with, so that we're not fighting with the treaty Indians, right. but we're still the same. It's sad because my mother is about as treaty as you can get, and my dad is treaty as you can possibly get. So uh, it's rather a sad thing, but we just have to live with it right now. It just, I just want to say that reality check. Status Indians who present their status card when purchasing gas on reserve are exempt. It doesn't apply to get purchasing gas at Costco, okay? So there's some clarification for you. Now when you hear the statement, indigenous people don't pay taxes, you will know differently, okay? This is also a reminder for me tonight, okay, to remind myself to tell you and share with you information that is, will bring you and I closer together, to understand each other, to know each other, to walk with each other. We're not gonna let $5 separate us. Yeah, I'm just about finished here, folks. Yeah. Sure. Number six is 
indigenous people receive pre post post secondary education. In my my years working with our people on the reserves in the city, in the country, in the north, many of our well, let me start. Each reserve gets an allotment of money from the federal government to send their people to university, college, or high school off to reserves. So there's money there. It's just one of the biggest issues is how it's spent and who it's spent to. A lot of Native people, like your children and my children, have to get uh, student loans. But if you can get help from your chief and council, that's very helpful. So a lot of our people pay their way through school. Many are fortunate, they get funded to go through school. My son got funded to go four years to university in Saskatoon. They give him housing allowance, food allowance, all that stuff. So some are fortunate, some have to pay. Um, my stepdaughter, for example, took her, I think, eight years or eight and a half. And she just graduated as a doctor and she paid her way through grants, scholarships, student loans, and a lot of, a lot of holding on tight to money. So it can be done. But that myth that all the Indians get free education it's not true, absolutely not true. I didn't get free. I, when I went to university and college and that, it wasn't free. You get to a point, I'm going to tell you, that you don't want anything free. Just salvation. Free. That's already paid. <clears throat> so, the protocol on the reserve is you go to the bad office, you apply to a college and say, listen, I want to go to school. Here's what, here's what it takes. Here's what it is. And the band will look at it. You're going to look at the cost for housing, bus transportation, food. Depends how many in your family. And then they do a budget and they approve or disapprove. So many of our people are going after uh, scholarships and grants to get them through uh, through school, university, or college. And there's so many bright spots today, I can tell you folks, many of our people have gone, come from the bottom and worked their way up and you see them in various, various positions. And they're not stopping there. We are teaching our children to get an education, to move on, to do good. But I can tell you one thing, as much as you do good, don't forget your people. Don't forget where you come from. Don't listen to those, say, to those myths that native people are lazy, they're unemployable. If you go to the reserve, they're as high as 70, 75% unemployment. There's nothing there. That's why so many of our people move where there's schools, where there's unemployment. Um, many of our people move for work so they can get jobs. So those things, there's so many bright spots. And there's, there's some stuff, to, well, stuff I share tonight. You could look at the negatives, but we look at the positives. And where do we fit in as believers, or at least myself, to make things better? And that's why I'm here tonight to, to, to help the church and help myself and to help the people, the first people to the land to come to know Jesus Christ as their personal savior. And I can tell you, once you get that, you will change. 
So now we've got to learn to walk with one another. All that I shared tonight, look at it from a big picture. How can I help? How can I be a part, a positive part, even if it's just a little bit? Don't say all those Indians are drunks. All those Indians get everything free. All those Indians get free housing. All those Indians get this, they get that. At the end, when we deal with land claims and treaty, you'll understand why. I'll give you an example. When I was working on a reserve in the Northwest Territories, there are Denny people. The government agent agreed when you sign the treaty, Every treaty day, we'll give you five dollars. We'll give you five nets, fishing nets, because that's what they did back then. And we'll give you some shells, some shotgun shells, and we'll give you one gun. That's it. So maybe back then in the 1800s, that was a lot of money, but that hasn't changed. Five dollars is still five dollars today. So what I'm leaving you, you with tonight is if you need to know more, just give me a call or give Pastor a call and I'll try my best to explain. But I hope tonight we dealt with governance, we've dealt with the structure, we dealt with the, the, the trail of where the money goes, what happens on the reserve, housing, elders care, addictions, sexual assault, all these things that are horrible, they're, they're even beyond the reserve. I was asked to speak at a reserve up by North Battleford, Saskatchewan, as an elder. And when, you, when you're an elder, you got the floor. And we, the subject was <clears throat> missing, murdered, Aboriginal women and girls. And uh, I say, in our culture, we say that our men were warriors. And historically, back then, our men were warriors. They went to war for a reason. And when I looked at the missing and murdered Aboriginal of women and girls, I noticed that 60% of our women, our Aboriginal women and girls were murdered by our own people. We have our own people selling our own people. They called them pimps. You went from a warrior to a pimp. To me, that's not our culture. That's not our tradition. That's not the way we live. That's not the way we want to live. And that's not the way we should live. And that's why we, today, we've got to understand each other, not look for blame, not point a finger, but try to understand as we walk together. I hope I didn't confuse you tonight. I tried my best. <clears throat> um, our show here is called The Salt and Pepper Team. <laughs> Just a joke. <laughs> okay, are you done? Yeah. Okay. Um, why don't we do some questions? Uh, it's eight forty-two. Uh, I, I, is that good, Norm? Yep. Is that good? Just twenty minutes of questions. Sure. And then we'll, we didn't get to the um, the Indian Act, but we can do that next time. Yeah. Okay. No, no, it's great. No, no, you you kill it, man. In a good way, it's great. Yeah. Um, why don't we get to some questions? If you are are brave enough, uh, you can unmute yourself and uh, and ask. If you just want to uh, throw it into the chat, then I I can be the voice. Actually, you know what? I think it's probably better if I read off the questions to Norm. Is that better for you? Yeah. Okay. So why don't you just throw it into into the <laughs> chat and uh, and I can be the re relayer to to Norm. Uh, we also have. Um, some great insight here. Uh, Bethany's chimed in on a few things. Bonnie's chimed in on, on a few things. I think Maxine, I, I'm not, 
I'm not sure who you are. So we also have other indigenous people here that I think can help us uh, with, with, with some of these things as well. So you got the floor, folks. What questions do you have? Maybe clarification or just whatever. We can just stare. We are. We can have a staring contest for the next like twenty minutes. <laughs> oh, Bethany! <laughs> Good to see you. <laughs> Another gopher from Fort Capel. <laughs> Thanks, Maxine. It's been awesome. All right, guys, come on. You got to have some questions. Hey, Chris, I'll uh, pipe in here. Thanks, Darren. Darren, yeah, I just, um, I had asked um, just on a, on a, um, what's the most positive changes that you've seen, Norm, uh, that we can all kind of uh, take heart, take to heart as far as um, kind of inroads for Christian ministry or just in regards to relationships, um, you know, building relationships with Indigenous peoples. What, what have you seen in the last, maybe say 10 years that has encouraged you? Did you hear it? Okay, sorry. Uh, the question was, uh, what positive changes have you seen with um, indigenous people building relationship with them? Even as you kind of mentioned, uh, there is there seems to be even some lift with employment and that sort of stuff. Like, I, I, think, I think what Darren's getting at is like shed some positive light on the situation. Is that right, Darren, kind of? Well, yeah, I mean, I know that I know that there's definitely progress. I mean, even the fact that we're on this call tonight and I know that in my role in corrections, I've been learning a lot too. So I know that there is an intentional effort being made on the part of people to learn more. So that's one positive change, but what have you experienced, Norm? in terms of positive changes that have helped to build relationships that we can just take part with. What, what positive changes have you seen regarding Indigenous Canadian relationships, even with your work up north and stuff like that? Like what, what positive things have you seen and experienced? Well, in all the places that I've been involved in, I am seeing more inclusion more we want to be a part of that's in the political arena provincially uh, locally uh, federally we see aboriginal people becoming members of parliament uh, wanting to make change wanting to give advice uh, wanting to lobby for their people uh, we see many of the reserves going joint venture with oil and gas companies with potash companies, with uranium companies, as far as hiring, uh, scholarships, uh, bringing money into the community, developing the skill to people. Uh, uh, you see our native people getting involved in real estate, uh, building homes, uh, building highways, all sorts of stuff. So you start to see joint venture businesses, uh, 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 schools, uh, colleges um, are really making a big effort to bring in Native people into the classroom. They're encouraging, they're having scholarships so that it can make it easier for people that don't have finances to become part of the school system. So I've seen in the last, oh, last 30, 40 years, a great move. And I really congratulate the Native people because they're wanting to make a change, not only for themselves, but for their children and their grandchildren and their communities. Um, one of the reserves that I'm working with are working with oil and gas companies 
and they're sitting at the table negotiating a deal for you and a deal for me and a win-win for everybody. So you start to see more of that. Awesome. Fantastic. Thanks, Norm. What else, guys? What other questions do you have? Chris, I have one. Um, it's Katie. It's a little bit outside of scope. Is that okay? Oh, of course. Okay. Um, well, and I guess there's a little bit of crossover because we're talking about government relations and structure and hierarchy and those kinds of things. Um, something that's really being debated a lot right now, and I've heard a few different Indigenous perspectives on it, but I'm curious about norms, um, is land acknowledgements and territorial acknowledgements when we enter into public spaces and have meetings. And I've noticed that we haven't done that in the two meetings that we've had so far. And I was just curious about Norm's perspective because I'm, I've heard it from a few different angles. Um, and an elder that I was speaking with recently was just talking about intent, you know, like yeah. why, why you would do it, why you would not, whether there's authentic meaning, whether there's transparency and how it crosses uh, from nation into nation and means different things in different places. But I think, you know, we saw down at the coast, I think it was Surrey, where they rejected the idea of doing territorial acknowledgements at the beginning of council meetings, but the TNRD is debating it right now too and opening up those conversations. Right. So I'm curious what how Norm feels about it, both in public spaces and then also as we look at a church context. What, what would it mean or is it necessary to have a, a land acknowledgement? Cool. Okay. Uh, Katie's question is... Sorry, um, that was long. <laughs> no, it's great. What's your feeling on land acknowledgements? Um, you know, right now you often hear beginning of a press conference, we're on the unceded territory of whatever. Um, there's kind of a debate right now whether you do it, whether you don't do it. How do you feel about land acknowledgements, whether it's in... Uh, whether it's a, a, a civil city meeting or whether at a church, how do you feel about that? Well, you have to look back at history. This land initially at one time belonged to the first people. And the government came and there's treaties and there's land claim. And right now, uh, I'm working with one area called Treaty 8. And anything that's done on that piece of land by any other group has to negotiate and talk to the chief and council and the members. And we'll go further. So that's what you one has to do. Now, if I come into your land, which you own a quarter section of land, and if I want to just come and do some work on there, I think I would hear really fast what are you doing on my property? Right. And that's what the native people are asking on this treaty land or this land claim. All we want to do is to be involved. So that really is sticky, but my feeling is in most times we can sit down, negotiate, reason what we are doing, what you're gonna do or what you wanna do with this land. And it really becomes an issue. Big signs, you're trespassing, you're on my land. But at one time, our people wandered. There was no borders. There was no fence posts. <laughs> we just wandered. But I know times have changed. But my feeling is, my experience is, we just want to know what you're going to do. That's all the rest we work on. So Norm, do you think that it would be appropriate once the pandemic is over, if at the start of a church service, a Catholic Alliance church, if I or somebody else got up and said, hey, everybody, welcome to church. Thanks for being here. I want to recognize that we are the unceded territory, the Shaquetmic people that have been here for X amount. Do you think that type of land acknowledgement publicly is good? Um, or how do you I, feel about that? Uh, it, should, it should come from an Aboriginal person, from somebody from that territory. I, if, I were, if I were going there, I would say, or if you came to my church, I would say, I want to welcome you on behalf of the Woodland Cree Nation. Right. But to have this, a non-native person say that, that that's kind of unacceptable. Right, okay, yeah. It, not because of color, it's 
where it's coming from. So normally when I'm in Saskatchewan and I go and speak in a church, I just say, I want to welcome you on behalf of the Woodland Cree Nation. And that's coming from an elder and from, from the Woodland Cree. Okay, yeah. So, so your feeling about land acknowledgements is, yes, we should do them if it's done or, <clears throat> under the right circumstances. That's right. Okay, yeah. yeah, good. And that's beautiful. That can really bring a lot of goodness yeah. by acknowledging that for sure. Well, one of the things I'll, I'll chime in here too, uh, I'm, I'm in pretty decent constant communication with uh, a professor at Ambrose, his name is Mark Buchanan. He was very close with uh, the Cowichan First Nation on the, on the island. Uh, and they incorporated land acknowledgements into every part of their, well, at the beginning of all of their services after a while. Uh, and, uh, and he said it was a very positive way to build strong relationship with indigenous people. There are other people uh, as I've talked even with Norm, uh, it's all about motive and intent. If it's just to check off the box, um, don't do it. And what Mark Buchanan said is like, there's, there's a way, um, there's a way to do it that uh, doesn't just feel cold. Like sometimes I think at least I've heard it when it's just a press conference and it's just check off the box. There's a way to do it that actually is a beautiful call to worship that God's been working in at all times, at all places, at all, anyway. So, so I, think, I think that's a great question. I think something that we need to uh, think about when it comes to KAC and the way that we practice uh, our faith moving forward. So. Yeah, and that, so that, that's why it's so important. To, don't, I would never suggest to patronize. Yeah. You know, so it might be well-meaning and everything, but that's, that's really looks not looked well at them. Yeah. Thanks, Katie. Is that helpful? Thank you. I can see you. Yeah, good. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Uh, any other questions, guys? You got a few more minutes. Maybe one one last question. Come on. I think I think what we'll do is um, if you do have a question, you can throw it in the chat. Maybe let's land the plane here, Norm. Okay. Let's finish. Um, oh, yeah, go ahead. Next um, next time is what that would be, would that be the 20th? Two weeks today. Two weeks, we're, we're going to deal with the Indian Act, which is really important. That'll really solidify what we've been talking tonight. And we're going to talk about uh, residential schools, the 60s school, and we're going to talk about, uh, yeah, those three for sure, and the Indian Act. So those are really heart-wrenching items. And we really, really, I would encourage you to open that window. And it's not, like I said earlier, it's not to lay blame or to point, anything like that, to shame anyone. That's not the way we function. It's history. Mm -hmm. I looked at it twice today. What history means mm -hmm. is to share. Mm -hmm. You know, I just want to show one last thing. I've been told several times, you know, <clears throat> Norman, uh, one guy who told me, oh, he called me a drunken Indian. And I just let him rattle off, rattle off. But I told him, I said, 42 years ago, God healed me. And this June, a few months from now, it'll be 43 years that I have not had a drink or a cigarette. So I'm not bragging, but I'm thanking God that he made me into that. So we're going to talk about that. Residential school, 60s school, and missing murdered women and Aboriginal girls. Those are really, really good for us to hear. Do I talk to him about Craig Duck Chief too, the next time? He's coming at the end. He's yes. The well, I think it'd be good for them yeah. to hear about him. We're having a uh, Aboriginal man come from Chase. He's involved in the band here. His name is Craig Duck Chief. He's going to come and do the last portion with me. So we're looking forward to that. I really believe that what we're doing here 
It's so important not only to us to grow, but yourselves to open the window wider and learn. It's not a one-way street, it's a two-way street. Amen. All right, uh, the last thing I, I wanna say is it's been really helpful for me as I've been talking with Norm Tons, uh, but also reading. I just wanna pass on, if, you, if you're interested for, with, for more, um, there is an author named Bob Joseph. He wrote a book called 21 Things You Didn't Know About the Indian Act. Uh, it's about 110, 15 pages. Uh, it's really, really helpful. Uh, so that's the first one, 21 Things You Didn't Know About the Indian Act by Bob Joseph. The second is uh, this book called In Indigenous Relations, Insights, Tips, and Suggestions to Make Reconciliation a Reality, also by Bob Joseph. Uh, helpful, easy to read, gets you caught up on a lot of these things, goes into more detail uh, about status, uh, about status and all that sort of stuff, things that we talked about today. So would recommend those resources to you uh, because I just think uh, the more that the more education you have, the more that your heart grows. And uh, I have been experiencing that, uh, getting to know and love Norm. And uh, and so I just would welcome you onto this journey. I think even the fact that we have this much, this much interest, you've been on Zoom for two hours tonight, shows that we're making progress. So I'm so grateful for your time. Uh, two weeks today, we'll we'll start up again. Uh, another two hours, uh, we'll we'll get at it. But I think uh, if that's it, Norm, uh, yes, I will put those books in the chat, Ben, for you. Uh, Norm, can you pray yeah. to end up our time? Yeah. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord Jesus, for this time, for the information, Lord. We thank you, Lord God, that there would be a healing beyond our understanding for each one, Lord, because you created each, every one of us, Lord. And Lord God, I, I just opened that window of understanding and learning, Lord. And I thank you for this opportunity tonight. I thank you for the every person that is listen in tonight lord that you would bless their home bless their family their children and their grandchildren father we thank you lord god that we could come together and i bless them a good night and a good rest in jesus name we pray amen amen thank you all for being here see you on the weekend online lots of love to you bye, -bye. Hey,